thank you. That was lovely. If you keep that cheerful vibration going for the rest of the year, you will have a good year. Yeah. If you replace that positive vibration with any other energy, you'll get a corresponding type of year. In other words, your mental equivalent manifests. Your consciousness takes form. I'll repeat. Your mental equivalent manifests in your life. Your consciousness takes form. That is not a promise. That is a law. Is it really as simple as that, you may ask? Well, I'll answer with a quote from Dr. Ernest Holmes, the founder of the religious science movement. For the benefit of newcomers, and I see a number of you here this morning, or new listeners and listening on the internet, religious science or science of mind is what we teach. And Dr. Holmes wrote, I quote, all the power of the universe is with you. Feel it, know it, and then act as if it were true, unquote. Dr. Holmes is saying there that action is important. It goes along with feeling the good vibrations of universal energy. So feeling first, action second. The two go together. And physical action is necessary sooner or later because we currently live on a physical plane and much of our pleasure and happiness, in fact most for some people, comes through our bodies. Please give me five physical activities that make us happy. Someone over here first. Eating, mm, yes. Dancing, yes. Singing. Laughing. One more. Exercising, exercising. Right? All, all these, all these. And there are so many more. Happiness comes through our bodies, but it starts with the mind. Excellent. So when you feel the good vibrations, when you feel those good vibrations, you can be sure that you're being divinely guided. Divinely guided. That phrase brings me to the topic of my talk. In the book room last Sunday, it's over that way for the newcomers. Lilith Nelson, oh, who, by the way, I heard on RJR this morning giving an excellent interview. It was very, really nice. Lilith Nelson said to me, talk about divine guidance. Now, our conversation was about the research I was conducting for today's talk. So you might think she was suggesting that my topic should be divine guidance. No, for I just told her that my topic was how to pray. What she was saying, exclaiming really, was that I was being divinely guided. It was as if you exclaim, talk about lucky, when you heard that an already wealthy friend of yours had gotten engaged to a multimillionaire. Talk about lucky. Lilith made the remark because because I just told her that minutes before, Reverend John had said I needed a short inspirational reading for today. Now that we no longer have readings from Creative Thought, which we have been having for decades, each speaker on Sunday has to bring along an inspirational message. So when Reverend Don told me this in the book room, I started wandering around the book room in search of such a passage and almost immediately came upon the pamphlet, The Golden Key, by Emmett Fox. Oh, by the way, I saw only one copy, though Reverend Anne says she'd check if there was another. So those who want to get it, one at the moment. There on the first page of The Golden Key was a passage that Sandy 
had read earlier about prayer. So Lily thought I was divinely guided because I found the passage so quickly. But story don't finish yet. The speaker of the day has to ask someone to read the passage he or she has chosen. So on Tuesday night following, at, practice, at a practitioner's meeting, I asked Sandy to read the passage today. I asked her because 17 or 18 years ago, when I was having heart trouble, broken heart trouble, <laughs> it was Sandy who introduced me to the golden key concept, which was just the medicine I needed. Coincidentally, you might say, a couple of days later, after that, after that, I discovered that Sandy would be my assistant today. You see things coming together? Coincidence or divine guidance? I say the latter. Now, that divine guidance had really started hours earlier last Sunday. All the previous week, I'd been wondering about what I should talk about today. And when I got up Sunday morning, I still did not know. As I was moving about doing early morning activities, Elaine, my wife, started operating her smartphone. Now, I am fascinated by them, for I don't have one. <laughs> my cell phone, which I hardly use, is about a decade old. It just makes calls. Imagine that, no photo taking, no Facebook, no Instagram, no Twitter. You make calls, amen. So fascinated by the smartphone, I asked Elaine to Google the New York Times. She punched some buttons or touched some apps. I really don't know what she did. And she brought up the newspaper. Right there in our bedroom, I read some of the New York Times news. I didn't have to go to the pharmacy, fork out $1,000. It was right there in a palm-sized gadget. Awesome. Yes, I know I sound like a dinosaur, but when I started working at the Gleaner ages ago, it was on a, something called a mechanical typewriter. You would have read about it with a, with a ribbon. After the New York Times, and all you have to do is put, type in NYT, it comes up. I asked Elaine to Google the story of the seven-year-old girl who, days before, had walked away from a small plane crash in Kentucky that left her parents and two other relatives dead. When she was examined later, the girl only had scratches and bruises. And the scratches might have come when she walked nearly a mile through bushes and over rough terrain, barefooted toward a light that she saw in the darkness, in the distance. It turned out to be a house light, and the homeowner took her inside, called 911, and the police got her to the hospital, where they found she was fine physically, apart from the aforementioned scratches and bruises. So I asked myself, how come she alone on the plane was saved? And immediately, a favorite story of the late Dr. Elmer, the founder of the Center for You Newcomers, Dr. Elmer Lumsden, a favorite story of hers came to mind. Many of you know it. Two little boys fell from a mango tree. One broke his arm, the other was fine. The boy with a break, let's call him boy one, asked boy two, how come he, boy two, didn't break anything? Boy two replied that he had said his prayers that morning. <laughs> boy one, but I prayed this morning too. Boy two, yes, but I was all prayed up. Dr. Elmer's point was that saying morning prayers and then forgetting God for the rest of the day was not the thing to do. One should, to use a biblical phrase, I quote, pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. That is being, praying without ceasing, that is being all prayed up. 
Now, as I remembered the story, this is all in the bedroom, and was thinking about the girl's life, that the girl's life might have been saved because she was all prayed up, two things occurred to me. One, it could be very useful for me to get a smartphone. <laughs> and then I immediately thought, but you'd have to learn how to use it. The other thought was that it's important and it's often a matter of life and death that people know how to pray. Those musings led me to my topic, how to pray. Specifically, how the science of mind teaches us to pray. As the topic came to me, I got all excited. Remember, I'd been searching for the topic all week. And I started to tell Elaine how important knowing how to pray was. For some 80% of the people who pray, and that's conservative in my opinion, 80% of people who pray, whether they're Christian, Jew, Muslim, Hindu, whatever, don't pray correctly. Now that's a tragedy. They believe in prayer, but according to our teaching, they don't pray correctly. So no wonder their prayers are not answered. Now, I'm not saying it's hard to pray correctly, but the universe is precise with the laws. You've got to do things right. If I got a smartphone in my hand now, I would not know how to operate it. I could learn, but you've got to know how to do the things. You've got to know how to pray. The terrorists who shot and killed so many people in Paris last week while shouting, Allah Akbar, God is great, really thought they were praying aright. But they're dead now. So, unless they wanted to die, they weren't praying aright. You see, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. If your prayers are not answered, Dr. Holmes teaches, you are not praying correctly. I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not judging people's conditions and saying if they are poor or if they are sick or if they are hungry or if they are companionless or jobless, etc., etc. They are praying incorrectly. I'm not saying that. Because there are people who don't want to be rich, who enjoy being sick, who are deliberately starving themselves so that they can get into a smaller dress size. They have their reasons. Who don't want a man or a woman, who don't want a job, etc. You see, people have the darndest desires. But you are the one who decides what you want. If you want to be poor, your business. Nobody else can decide for you. What I am saying that if you really want something and you pray for it and don't get it, you are not praying correctly. And you will never be prayed up if you don't change your way of prayer. Why am I so sure of this? Here is the awesome truth. The universe always says yes to your prayer request. It cannot repeat, cannot refuse your prayer. And I'm defining here, prayer here, as focused intention. The reason that I told you in so much detail how I came to choose my topic for this message is because the process was an example of my focused intention bearing fruit. I set my intention to get the topic during the week and all the components that I mentioned, Elaine playing with her smartphone at that particular moment, the plane crash story, Reverend John telling me about the inspirational message, Sandy introducing me to the golden key years before. Yes, even that, because God operates outside of time. All these things, they all came together to give me my topic because I had set my intention. There are no coincidences. Order is heaven's first law. Page one of Thomas Troward's The Creative Process in the Individual. 
That course, you heard earlier, begins Thursday, January 15, 10.30 a.m. Take it if you're interested. We, the universe says that for every effect, there is a cause. It operates very precisely. So we come now to the crux of the issue. What is the correct way to pray? Sandy read the first couple of paragraphs in the Golden Key and stopped in what is called a cliffhanger. That is just before she reached the Golden Key itself. So I'll now continue the passage. Emmett Fox continues, I quote, as for the actual method of working, like all fundamental things, it is simplicity itself. All you have to do is this. Stop thinking about the difficulty, whatever it is, and think about God instead. That is the complete rule. And if you will only do this, the trouble, whatever it is, will presently disappear. It makes no difference what kind of trouble it is. It may be a big thing or a little thing. It may concern health, finance, a lawsuit, a quarrel, an accident, or anything else conceivable. But whatever it is, stop thinking about it and think about God instead. That is all you have to do." Unquote. That was Emmett Fox. Now back to Dr. Holmes. He also has a view on prayer. Explaining the difference bet between prayer as, at his, as it is generally regarded and our type of prayer, scientific prayer, spiritual mind treatment, or as we now call it, affirmative prayer. Ernest Holmes wrote this in The Science of Mind, his book. I quote, if when one prays, his prayer is a recognition of spirit's omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence, and a realization of man's unity with spirit, then his prayer is a spiritual mind treatment. If, on the other hand, one is holding to the viewpoint that God is some far off being whom he would ap approach with doubt in his thoughts, wondering if by some good luck he may be able to placate God or persuade him of the wisdom of one's request, then there is but little similarity between prayer and treatment. Nothing could bring greater discouragement to labor than to labor under the delusion that God is a being of moods who might answer some prayers and not others. It would be difficult, Dr. Holmes continues, it would be difficult to believe in a God who cares more for one person than another. There can be no God who is kindly disposed one day and cruel the next. There can be no God who creates us with tendencies and impulses we can scarcely comprehend and then eternally punishes us when we make mistakes." Unquote. Now, as I understand it, all other religions have some dogmas. I'm not saying fundamentally, I'm just saying all of them have some other dogmas showing God as the opposite of how Dr. Holmes said God should be viewed. Those dogmas suggest a moody God, a partisan God, a warlike God, a God who is far away in the sky. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. The, that quotation that I just read from Dr. Holmes is in the chapter in his book on prayer. It's well worth a read or reread, as the case may be. In another chapter later on, Dr. Holmes says, I quote, in treatment, we turn entirely away from the condition because as long as we look at it, we cannot overcome it, unquote. Turn entirely away from the condition. 
So, let's test you. If you feel that you want no longer to be poor, what are you going to focus on? If you feel you no longer want to be ill, what do you focus on? If you feel you no longer want to be fat, what do you focus on? If you, you know, the opposite. If you no longer want to be maga, what do you focus on? Some meat on your bones. If you no longer want to be, in your, in your view, a failure, what do you focus on? Success. You got it. Dr. Holmes says, you turn away from the condition that you don't want and focus on the opposite. And where your focus goes, energy flows. That echoes Dr. I'm, I'm sorry, that, that quotation of Dr. Holmes echoes Emmett Fox's statement earlier. Stop thinking about the difficulty, whatever it is, and think about God itself. The two complement each other. Now, what does thinking about God mean? It means thinking about things that are lovely and of good report. It means seeing the world as benevolent. It means giving thanks in all things. First the Thessalonians, chapter 5, verse 18. In all things give thanks. It means seeing beauty in the world, or as William Wordsworth poetically puts it, seeing splendor in the grass, glory in the flower. It means being nice to yourself. It means being an optimist and expecting good outcomes. Even when you feel you are in the valley of the shadow, it means loving your neighbor as yourself. I know that some of you, especially the newcomers, will have questions about that. See Sandy and myself afterwards, or better still, come to classes. We have three of them starting this term, and you will get answers. And loving God, thinking about God, also means making a joyful noise unto the Lord. Valerie, maestro, music please. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. You and me, brother. In his hands he's got you and me, sister. In his hands he's got you and me, mister. In his hands he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world. In his hands he's got the whole wide world. In his hands he's got the whole world. In his hands he's got the whole world. Namaste.